are the low director's chairs. <laughs> um, so let's start at the beginning. How did the two of you meet and decide to make this film? Is that for me? I think it's for both of you. You, you start. You start. You yeah, start. You start. You started, you started it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, of course, I, I, I was um, really aware of Grace Jones as a 14, 15 year old child growing up, and I wondered when I saw the cover of Island Life, what kind of a woman is that? <laughs> and uh, fast forward, I made a film about Noel Jones' church community in Compton, Los Angeles, and it was, I like to say that Grace and I met in church because I made a film about his church and his church community, and Grace magically attended the first ever screening of that film and we immediately had a lot to talk about. Yep. <laughs> and a lot. and you, Gra what, Grace, what, Grace what, said... Sophie, what year was that? That was 2003. God, you do the math good. I've oh been asked God. this a lot. No, oh, 2003? <laughs> mm. Okay. Or 2002, 2003. Something. Yeah, okay. Mm. And so how did the conversation go from there to let's make a documentary? How, well, how, how did you Grace, feel? You, Grace said, honey, I am church burnt <laughs> to <laughs> a cinder, to <laughs> a crisp. <laughs> I'm church burnt. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that means a lot of church, <laughs> a lot of church. So do you remember that conversation? I, yeah, it was in a restaurant parade. called Etoile in Soho in, in London. Yeah, I, I do remember. I don't remember specifically. But yeah, but that's okay. I don't remember a lot of things. But I do know, I do remember that when I saw the film, I, I was like, let's do something. That was the decision right away. Let's do it. And my brother, Noel, he talked so much about you with me. I don't, you know, you weren't there, but he did talk a lot about Sophie. I felt like she was part of a family. You so the, com the comfort... I felt immediately the like she was a uh, sister, in, you know? So the comfort was there before yeah, you had even gotten exactly, into the project. Exactly, exactly. And I love the film. And it was, you know... It, it's a very it was, visual film. Yeah, the, and and Grace, you know, is a you're a very visual person, mm -hmm. and I think that was where, you know, she could read that film through its visual language, and mm -hmm. you know that's why it's, for me the the pleasure of the cinema just as a viewer, and the idea that this film can be experienced in this way, you know, and to be here at the uh, you know at the film center, means a lot to me because, you know, Grace reminds me she's got the. You know that, that word that Lorca uses, the duende? She's got this kind of... You're naturally, on film and on stage, a fantastic presence. And film, you know, there's a, a great article written by a film theorist about cinema and talking about the one-man show and saying that ultimately all cinema is located within watching a body on screen. And... He, he writes this fantastic piece about you in this context as being pure cinema. So, you know, to make something in the humble form of a documentary, but to reach for something large in the sense that, that cinema is, Grace was a fantastic collaborator for me. Thank you. And how was it for you, Grace? For me? Oh, yeah. Well, I won't embarrass her by saying certain things. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. I won't. <laughs> you know, it's like having sex, you know what I mean, in a way. See, I'm embarrassing, you know. But, no, it's, it, it, it's when it's working really great, it works. I, it's almost as if I, I don't have to say or worry about what Sophie is doing. I, not preoccupied, normally I would be 
What are you doing? Where's the light? Where, you know, like focused on, on details, but Sophie had all of that. Uh, and I saw that she had that, and I didn't have to worry because I am, I am terrible at details. You know, you can ask anybody, you now want to take a picture, I'll go, where's the light? You were styling uh, it. You know, yeah, you know, so, and the positions and the compositions and... Yeah, framing, so, framing. Yeah, framing. Framing and light. That. And Sophie was just, she was already beyond me, you know, in that, in that area, you know, really. I would like to do some more directing, so maybe we can do something. Well, I, I remember <laughs> the first scene that, that we shot was the vocal sessions in the studio. Mm -mm. And, you know, that was already where there was just an unspoken dialogue. Because I was talking about, you know, your profile and how, as, mm. as much as it was about the conversation with Sly and Robbie and the recording mm. of the vocals, it was also about how you were kind of play, I felt like I was playing with you with frontal profile, mm -hmm. frontal. Mm -hmm. It was like a ballet, it was like something yeah. unfolding. And it's a sort of unspoken yeah. dialogue that you, yeah. you, you know, that I felt we were lucky enough to find quite quickly. Oh, that's awesome. It was waiting for us. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. So, on the flip side, then why did it take such a long time to finish? To finish? It didn't take a long time to finish. It was a long time doing. Oh, just a, just a long time to shoot. <laughs> well, you know, ah. I, I remember Grace saying to me, I'm not in any hurry. <laughs> and I thought, okay, yeah. that's the direction. That's, this is part of like listening mm -hmm. to what you were, how you were feeling and bringing that right in. Also about the performance, having heard Grace talk a lot about what, you know, your feelings about theater, about performance, and about light, and taking mm -hmm. all of that that I was learning over that time, the time it took for Grace to form the band and, you know, work with the band on the road, so they've already got that mm -hmm. dialogue on stage that, again, is an unspoken understanding about how you work with mm -hmm. the band. And so, you know, it took the time it took. It's, you know... Um, yeah. And there was a lot of stuff in between as well. It wasn't just... The focus wasn't just on the filming. I mean, Sophie w was doing other films as sure. well. Sure, sure. I was I had to take time out to write my book, so there was a two-year. I had a baby. And you had a baby. Thank you very much. You know. Ah! <laughs> ah! Okay. You know, pushing it out. My baby was already, yeah, I'm, God, I'm godmother, aren't mother to her baby. So, um, and so it, a lot of things. I'm always touring. You might not see me here. If I'm not here, I'm somewhere else. And also, you know, it takes time and, to raise money. Uh, yeah. And yeah, we did it with no money. Yeah. We did it really. I mean, when I say no money, I mean, we got the money after we were done. Well, we, we, the, the, all of the documentary, the it felt important we to me. <laughs> it felt mm. important to me that we could make the documentary mm. without any third parties. Exactly. That we were free. I really love that. We were free, as Grace said on one of the conversations that we did mm. on the red carpet when we were releasing the film in London, and someone said to you, oh, Grace, do you know, is this how you wanted the film to be? Did you? you said, well, when you conceive a child, you don't know what it will become. <laughs> And, and that was, that's just hits the nail on the head. It was like a seed sown, and then we just let it grow. Yeah, yeah. and that's the yellow brick road. <laughs> yeah, we followed the, I would say, follow the yellow brick road, because it talks, it, if we had done it with a time frame or something, something like that, there would have been things that would not have happened that would have not been in the film. And this is what's so beautiful about... Yeah, it moves very take, naturally, uh, yeah. Just, you know, it's a take your time. It's okay. There's no hurry. You know, and things happen that then we're able to get in the film. Had we been on a tight schedule or something like that, you wouldn't have the inspiration that uh, tells the story. It would not have been created until it is created, you know? 
And then Absolutely. you know that, okay, now we can film this. This is happening here. This I, I go like, hey, Sophie, can you come? I'm going to Jamaica now. Can you come when you're busy? And she's like, yeah, I can come. And she's there with her big wheel. That's the fig rig. Oh, her camera so circular, a big like, wheel, a like a wheel driving wheel with a camera car. in the middle. And uh, <laughs> I have to massage her back after a bit, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, you know, the time it takes to imagine how to structure it mm. and to learn about how that might be appropriate, right for the material, discovering mm. what the material can do. Yeah. You know, exploring that. So all that was done not as a forethought, but after you gathered the material and started cutting it together. I mean, it, it, it has this very poetic quality to the way that it's put together, not in any sort of chronological order with, with the live scenes, particularly the club scene is a great little diversion <laughs> moment. Well, I just thought that line that Grace came up with about, you know, I'd like, you know, when I die, I'd like to have the hand of a ghost that I love holding my hand, Timothy Leary. That was just the most extraordinary vision and beautiful idea, you know, just to imagine that. Um, and, and there's so many more things that you came up with, Grace, that I couldn't get in there. You're, you're like, you know, this is something about Jamaican culture, the, the play with language, the kind of inventive sense of language. Is that a Jamaican? Yeah. Jamaican. I know some Jamaicans here, yeah. Okay, yeah. in the house. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always say that um, you won't understand me really. I mean, people would think I really come from another planet. And I just say, come to Jamaica and you will get me. I, Honestly, you know, I mean, I had a husband who says I married a man. And they know Jamaican women rule. The women rule. They're the judges. You know, they're very, very strong force. And, and the men just go around looking beautiful. <laughs> yeah, get like, crazy. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, man, I'm beautiful. <laughs> I don't think, yeah, you say it's a lion culture. It's a lion culture for the men and lioness for the women. But the, yeah, we rule over there. It's like, yeah, it's very hard to come, you know, like to America where the women are like, you know, oh, yeah, fix me food and stuff. The husband like, yeah, where's my breakfast and shit? You know, no, man, Jamaican men, they fix the lionesses the breakfast. They do the cooking. It's completely, I mean, they play. When I came to America and they were playing basketball, I went, men playing basketball? It's a girl's game. <laughs> it's a girl's game. In Jamaica, the girls play basketball, not the men. So I kind of came on, like, you know, a, a flip side of an like, upside down world. In but a it's way, also so very patriarchal, that mass understood. pee. Yeah, but don't forget, he married my grandmother, who was 20-something years older. So mass pee was looking for a mother. Okay. <laughs> and no kids. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and then feeling, I believe he had a lot of pressure to prove himself because my grand uncle was the bishop, Pentecostal bishop of the island, you know, and he was really p secretively powerful, you know, one of those like passive aggressors, you know, kind of people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that you don't approach him, his power is very silent, but scary. Yeah, yeah. So I think Mas P, you know, I mean, he married my grand uncle's sister, and I think he just kind of thought, mm, maybe I can become a bishop, you know? It was kind of political, Manuka. Pentecostal political, I guess. That's coming out of my... Yeah. 
Yeah, Pentecostal political in a way. That's a part of it, I think. And um, yeah, my brother Noel has a different point of view from, from uh, his point of view. It's completely different. He kind of opened my eyes in a way because he said, look, you know, you got to give my speed credit. He married our grandmother who, you know, could not have kids. Not like now you can just put something up there and you can be 60 or 70 and push out a baby. But it's not like that. Uh, yeah, it, it, it happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, he, his point of view made a lot of sense to me and I, I didn't think about it. He didn't want children to marry 20 years, 25 years older. And then he ended up with you know, five of us at his doorstep. So he just didn't know what to do. And he was like, kind of thinking, maybe we should be looking at dad. I was like, whoops. <laughs> but then you know they were I mean? so young, and what were they escaping from? Well, or building? they escaped from what we... <laughs> yeah, they escaped from where we were, you know. But they were, my mom was 16, 17. My dad, early 20s, you know, and uh, yeah, amazing. I grew, I, I mean, I used to hate him because he was, he kind of was scary. His eyes, you know, had this mystery in his eyes. I, you saw him in the film. I, he, he did um, agriculture. He was brought to America to, to teach the people how to plant. Your dad? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was a boxer as well, wasn't and he? And he did amateur boxing. Mm -hmm. You don't want him to hit you. You know, you just, uh, you just see stars if he hits you. So actually, so he was not a violent person. Mm. But it's funny, Mas P didn't do boxing, and he was the more, you know, violent one in his way. You Sadistic. Know? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think just before he was going to commit suicide, my dad, he had a calling. Yeah, something about being in the subway in New York and something telling him to jump, jump, jump. I mean, it's not in the film, but he, we have these stories, you know, when we're together. He's like, yeah, they told me, jump, jump, jump. And then he got, he said he got the calling, you know, to yeah. become a preacher. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. How, how old was he when that happened? Uh, oh, uh, early 20s, mid 20s, maybe. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I'm bad at the math. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would have been early 20s. And it was certainly yeah. his, his experience of being mm -hmm. saved was a huge moment in, his, in your dad's life, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Mm. And my brother is a complete opposite. He's How so? A, he's on the edge. If you go to Noel, to the film that she did called Hoover Street Revival, I only go to his church because he really doesn't preach at you. I hate preaching at you. He, he teaches, he educates you about everything that's happening around you so, and somehow connects it to the scriptures, to the book. And, but he brings it in a very modern way. He's just, and it throws it at you forward, you know, into the time we are now, because you, there's no way you can have a religion that was so old, but as long as it's old, it's wise, but it still has to do with something that goes on forever. There's like an eternity in everything that, um, that he talks about about when you go to his church, you know, because that's the only, I, I just go, I don't go for the choir. We used to go for the choir and the music, and then when the preacher comes on, you slowly leave. <laughs> you like, tiptoeing out the back door, you know? And with him, it's the opposite. I, I let the fanfare go on, and I go to hear what he has to say, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, that and was these two together, when you see her and my brother together, I mean, you can't pull them apart. It's like your brains just mesh and it gets very intellectual. You have to go, you have to go to the 
dictionary after you guys have finished talking. <laughs> <laughs> But that was my experience, actually, when I went to his church, was because I went to hear great gospel music. Mm -hmm. And we drove away, me and my boyfriend at the time, going, yeah, the choirs were great. But the preacher... Yeah, he was quoting Paul Tillich, mm -hmm. who was an existential theologian, mm -hmm. and also yeah. Rollo May, and various, you know, psychoanalytical people yeah. he's quoting in the middle of Compton. And uh, the extraordinary... And that, so that was just amazing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the, the, he was immediately riveting of what he was saying and how he was exploring ideas and... Uh, in, funnily enough, actually, I then was able to give him a handwritten sermon by Paul Tillich that I met a lady I'd known who'd worked in the UN. Then she'd l ended up living in the west coast of Ireland where I grew up as a child, and she and her husband... I think they might have been American spies originally, but then they, <laughs> they, they gave it up and they, they started a self-sufficiency kind of life in the west of Ireland. And then I went back and I said to her, I'm making this film, and she said, I was Paul Tillich's student. Here, give this to your preacher friend. It's called the Yes, No Sermon. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Ah. I always tell him to stop saying yes and say more no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have only a couple more minutes, and uh, this being uh, the Film Society of Lincoln Center, I wanted to end with... Uh, Uh, short questions for you both that uh, touch upon the breadth of your movie career. For first, Sophie, uh, what are the differences and similarity and or similarities of making films with uh, Slavo Zizek and Grace Jones? <laughs> what are the differences and similarities? Well, um, God. That's really hard for me to kind of answer succinctly. I did stumble on an answer to a similar question, but I can't remember what I came up with then. But uh, yeah, let it out. Well, you know, <laughs> Slavoj is pathologically punctual. Oh! There you go. <laughs> And Grace is. I got here before you did tonight. Stop it. She did. That, that, I, I can confirm that Grace came before hey. Sophie tonight. That's, that's because hey. in this city, you're lucky if you're, you spend the whole time pulled up to the bumper. You can't move. <laughs> <laughs> that's New York. I said, better get out and walk. All right. M It Ms. wasn't raining. Sorry. Miss Jones, one for you now. Um, uh, last night during the Times talk, uh, you revealed one great creative regret, which... Uh, was passing on a film. Yeah. Um, do you mind uh, repeating what that is and talking a little bit about that decision? Okay, I, yeah. Ridley I was, I was Scott um, sent me a script to do Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, yeah. And, you know, sometimes falling in love is falling. <laughs> you know, I just... After, I just, I don't want to fall in love anymore because I was so in love with Jean-Paul, fallen in love with Jean-Paul. And I didn't realize they were competing with each other. And he basically talked me out of doing the film. Yeah, he was like, we were so underground artists, you know. You know, the underground artists, we, it's a lot of kind of resistance to the pop world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you resist. Yeah. Oh, they just want to pop and make you into some kind of cartoon character, you know? And so, yeah, I turned, I did, I turned it down and then I was flying back to Paris, I remember, or from Paris, or to Paris, from Paris. I And I read the script, and I really liked it. And I said, when I arrive, I'm going to call and say, fuck it, I'm going to do it. I don't care what he talked me out of doing. You know? yeah. And um, he said, oh, too late. We've already casted. Yeah, because they're very quick. Very quick. There's always somebody in the wings. You know what I mean? You are disposable kind of thing. Uh, but th apparently they made the part a lot smaller when I refused to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, they shrunk it. 
Uh, and there was the snake lady part where she gets like through the glass windows, hit by the bus, the, the, on and on and on. And, but after that, I, I really decided I have to make up my own mind. You, you learn. I learned a big lesson from that. And, you know, yeah. And Ridley never called me back. He only cast girls that look like me. <laughs> no, no, honestly. And, and it used to come when I was doing James Bond, and he would come to the apartment, and my mom would be cooking curry goat and rice and peas. And he'd come and party, but he never called me back for a film because, I mean, it's a little secret, not a secret anymore, but apparently he fell in love with the girl that um, he casted in my part and she broke his heart and it's my fault. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Grace Jones and Sophie Fines. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.